Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Matthew's. Uh, from today, our guidelines for worship have changed and social distancing and face coverings are no longer required. Uh, but you are welcome uh, to wear your face covering if you would prefer to do so. Uh, socially distanced seating is also available in the side aisle uh, if you prefer that. Today is Palm Sunday uh, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem uh, with the crowds cheering and praising, uh, welcoming him as the coming king. Tonight uh, we'll focus in particular on Palm Sunday at our praise service. Uh, but this morning we're further into the events of Holy Week with the trial of Jesus and Peter's denial of him. We stand as we begin with a shout of praise. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. We sing, here is love, vast as the ocean. Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed. Forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Our 
psalm today is Psalm 118. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is written in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, reading verses 13 to 15. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one, like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for this song of praise from Revelation, the cantable great and wonderful. Great and wonderful are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who shall not revere and praise your name, O Lord? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship in your presence. For your just feelings have been revealed. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour, glory and might, for ever and ever. Amen. Our second reading is written in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, reading verses 53, 72. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders and teachers of the law, came together. Peter followed them, sorry, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find him. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I have destroyed this man-made temple, and in three days will build another, not built by man. Even yet then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony? that these men are bringing against you. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes, why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him, they blindfolded him, 
struck him with her fist and said, Prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. When Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When they saw Peter warning himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you are talking about. Immediately, the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word of Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we look to you now. Speak to us from your precious word. May we know you as our Saviour, full of grace and truth. Amen. C.S. Lewis, the Belfast boy who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, and all the rest of them, uh, also wrote an essay entitled God in the Dark. In it, he speaks of how the people of the 20th century had reversed the idea of God being the judge of all and instead thought of people taking the bench and God being in the dark, standing accused, being judged by all. In our Bible reading today from Mark's Gospel, we find God in the dark, on trial in front of the religious leaders of Israel. Last week, we saw how Jesus had been betrayed by a close friend and arrested. And not very long after that, Jesus is on trial, brought before the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law. And they must have been uh, called together uh, in advance when they knew that the arrest was going ahead and they weren't going to waste a moment once he was in custody. But as we see in verses 53 to 65, and you have them uh, hopefully open before you there uh, on the service sheet, uh, the trial of Jesus is a farce. Throughout Mark's Gospel, uh, since chapter 3, verse 6, the religious leaders have been plotting to kill Jesus. And so now that they have their hands on him, uh, they are determined to force through that conclusion, no matter what. This isn't a fair and free trial, with a presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Now look at verse 55. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish ruling council, they were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. They're starting with the verdict. They're starting with what they want to do to Jesus and then they want to find evidence that will allow them to do that. They're not weighing the evidence and seeing where it takes them. They're starting with the verdict and looking for evidence that will fit. This is not justice. This is prejudice. The farcical trial with the forced conclusion hears lots of false testimony. Many testified against him. But their statements did not agree because it was all false testimony. 
And then even when they seem to stumble upon something that Jesus actually did say about destroying this temple and him raising it up in three days, speaking about his body being killed and rising on the third day, they still don't agree on what he actually said. How do you react when you're falsely accused? Our natural inclination is to speak up, to defend ourselves, to tell our side of the story, to put the other person right. And yet throughout this false testimony, and even when asked by the high priest, verse 61, but Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. As Isaiah 53, 7 says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus only opens his mouth to answer the direct question put to him by the high priest in verse 61. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And do you see how Jesus replies? He says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Ask a straight question, get a straight answer. Jesus is indeed the Christ, the promised anointed King, the Son of God. He identifies himself there as the Son of Man from Daniel 7, from our first Bible reading, and says that at these religious leaders and everyone will see Jesus at the right hand of God coming on the clouds. Jesus speaks the truth to them, but they can't handle the truth. God is in the dark. But they condemn Jesus of blasphemy, insulting God by claiming to be God. God is in the dock and is judged and is rejected, just as many do today. So this court uh, doesn't need their false witnesses now. They've heard Jesus speak what to them sounds like blasphemy, but is absolutely the truth. And so the farcical trial of Jesus ends with them spitting at him, blindfolding him, striking him with their fists, calling on him to uh, prophesy, to tell them. Uh, to tell them at which one of them has hit him before the guards take him and beat him. This is what we humans choose to do to God. Ever since the Garden of Eden, ever since Adam and Eve, we have been deciding that we know better than God. Sitting in judgment on him. No matter what it was going to take, Jesus was going to be condemned to death. We just want rid of God. And at the same time as the trial of Jesus, another trial was taking place. Not this time in the judicial sense, not a courtroom, but more in a, in a celebrity kind of trial, an ordeal. 
You see, last week we watched as all the disciples fled from Jesus. They scattered just as he had said. But did you notice there in verse 54, Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself by the fire. Peter had said that he would rather die with Jesus than deny him. And despite the obvious danger here, he has followed still. So, is there a glimmer of hope here for Peter? Some, uh, some bravery remaining? Is he going to turn out uh, good in the end? Well, it's a servant girl who notices Peter sitting by the fire. She must have uh, gone out with the mob earlier in the evening when they were going to arrest Jesus. And she thinks she recognises him from somewhere. You know the way that sometimes you know you know someone, but you don't know how you know them. And she's looking at him and she's thinking, where have I seen you before? And then she realises that he had been the sword wielding, uh, sword wielding associate of the man who's now their prisoner. And she says to him, You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it. He says, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the entrance. The first denial has already slipped out. Not when confronted with a guard, not at sword point, but when faced with a slave girl. So he moves away from the fire, moves away from that light source, and moves towards the dark where he hopes that he won't be seen again. But she's sure that she knows him now. And so she goes over and says to the people standing around, verse 69, This fellow is one of them. And again, he denied it. Two down, one to go. As Peter had been talking, his accent had given him away. You see, remember that they're in metropolitan Jerusalem. And so the regional accent of the people of far flung Galilee is instantly recognisable. I don't offend anybody, but think of a Balamean accent, which is instantly noticeable. Or um, a Fermanagh accent. And so. The people say to him, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And how does he react? He began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And just with that, the cock a second time and Peter remembers what Jesus had told him about that very night back in verse 30 of how he would disown Jesus three times he had been defiant but now he has denied knowing Jesus or knowing anything about him So while the farcical trial of Jesus is going on, the frantic denial of Jesus is coming out of Peter's mouth. And he broke down and wept. How 
have you ever been there? Do you deny knowing Jesus? Do you deny having anything to do with him? Perhaps you're in company and the conversation comes to the wrongs of the church and the wrongs of religion and you think, oh, I don't want to go there today. And you stay quiet. More people are talking about moral issues and you know what Jesus thinks of whatever it is. And you go, not today, Lord. We'll just keep the pleasant conversation going and I won't have to identify with you and with your words. Peter is disappointed in himself. He's distraught. He's a disciple of Jesus who has disowned Jesus. And the scattering has happened. It seems as if it's all over. Jesus is on his way to be killed. Everything that Peter had given himself to over the past three years, it's over. It's finished. Peter, the leading disciple, and he waits. But is it really finished? You see, Jesus is who he says he is. He really is the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One. And Jesus had told his disciples that he would not only be killed, but that he would rise again. Next Sunday, spoiler alert, Next Sunday, we read of the women at the empty tomb. And listen to what the young man dressed in white says to them. He says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Did you hear it? Tell his disciples and Peter. Peter, the denier, is mentioned specifically on Easter morning. Peter is to be told about Jesus' resurrection. And Peter will be restored by Jesus. Peter shows us that Jesus provides forgiveness for all our sins. Even disowning him and denying him. So if you knew what I was talking about there a few moments ago. You felt the heat. Uh, you felt uh, the peer pressure uh, and you've remained silent or you've denied knowing Jesus. There is forgiveness and restoration because Jesus, God's Son, submitted to this miscarriage of justice, this farce of a trial, to die in our place. For our sins. And he calls you. By name. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. You are good. And always do. What is good. Yet you were hated and oppressed and condemned to death. Thank you that in your wounds 
we find our peace. That we can be restored and forgiven by your amazing grace. Help us, Lord, to turn to you afresh today and experience that wonder this week for the glory of your name. going to sing a song now in response, uh, which will lead you probably to most of us, uh, about the events of Jerusalem uh, in that first Holy Week. Uh, the group are going to sing the first verse while we remain seated, and then at the end of the first verse, uh, we'll all stand and sing the whole thing through again from the start. We sing Jerusalem.
Son of the Blessed One. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated. On Wednesday night past, we held our Easter Vestry meeting, uh, and I'd like to invite our church wardens, glee wardens, and select vestry members to come forward for their commissioning. That's uh, so John Davies and Timmy Campbell, our church wardens, Carol Burnett and Garfield McCoy, our glee wardens, and the select vestry members, Billy Atwell, Lawson Burnett, Mary Colba. Tanya Campbell, Lorraine Hall, Gary McNally, Jerry Piddock, and Linda Pillow. Invite you to come forward now. You have been called to a ministry in this congregation. Will you, as long as you are engaged in this work, perform it with diligence? I will, with God's help. Will you faithfully and reverently execute the duties of your ministry to the honour of God and to the benefit of this congregation? I, I will, with God's help. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts you have given and for all who serve you in so many ways. Bless these, your servants, with your grace and strengthen them in your service for the glory and praise of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's congratulate them as they take their seats. take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you hear all things that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may receive from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are exalted as head over all. You are the head of your body, the church. Bless your church, we pray, and give to us courage to proclaim that you are Lord. Remind us afresh of your love for us and for the world in this most holy of weeks. 
draw people to you for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, your kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Bring peace to our world and especially to Ukraine. Turn the hearts of those who govern unjustly and stop violence and oppression. Bless Elizabeth, our Queen, and our nation, that integrity and justice may be at the heart of our common life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you were falsely accused and unjustly treated and suffered at the hands of sinful men. Give your comfort and courage to all who suffer today. Relieve their pain and strengthen their resolve. Help them to know that you care for them that you will judge on the last day, but that your mercy triumphs over justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for those who are ill today, at home or in hospital, nursing home or hospital, we pray that you would be at work to heal and to bless and to restore. We pray for those who mourn and ask that they would know at your resurrection hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you will never disown those who come to you that you will never drive them away. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You'll see the notices on the service sheet. Uh, tonight at 6.30 we have our Palm Sunday praise service in the hall uh, and you can get a sneak peek at the prayer room uh, which is already set up. Uh, thank you to all who have used their talents uh, to create that, respect, that uh, reflective space for us this week. The prayer room itself will be open uh, each day this week between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock as well as before and after the services. Do feel free to drop in and stay for as long or as short as you can. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the characters around the cross each night this week at 7.30 and the choir will be providing special music tomorrow night on Good Friday night and then next Sunday morning and evening and the choir are um, meeting for short practice after the service this morning. Uh, Organisations are invited to decorate a window uh, for our Easter Sunday services next week uh, and next Sunday there is the Dawn service at the Argory at 6.30am, our Easter family celebration at 11 uh, and an Easter praise service at 630 and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there's a memorial service for Jack McNally. 
Uh, we're hoping to resume after church refreshments again uh, on Sunday mornings after Easter. Uh, so if you would be able to organise the route in, uh, to get people to help with that, uh, or you would be able to help some Sunday, uh, then please do let me know. Looking slightly further ahead, uh, we're holding an auction on Saturday the 21st of May. Uh, so if you have any saleable items, uh, could you please hold on to them until nearer the time. And finally, can I say that it's great to see so many people's faces again this morning. Uh, I think we've, we've noticed the, the change in terms of responses and in terms of singing, uh, and it's great to see that you're not sticking your tongue out at me from behind the mask or anything like that. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn as we reflect on the power of the cross.
Christ draw you to himself and grant that you find in his cross a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.